Good. Okay. The recording, I think. Um, so yeah, I guess um, we could start now. Um, Rosalind will probably come in a couple of minutes, so we'll be good. So um, let me introduce our speaker. Um, he's Hayden Hunter, um, which probably most of you know. Um, he's from, well, he was from USF until I think what, last year? A year and a half ago, maybe now? A year, yeah. Less than a year. Less than a year ago. I was at USF, but now he's at UF as a graduate student. Um, so he's gonna be talking to us about differential geometry um, and minimal surfaces. So it's all yours, Hayden. All right, cool. It's a bit of an introduction, so nothing is going to be too or terribly complicated. Um, I'm kind of relying on people knowing a little bit of point set topology if I need it. Um, but other than that, there's, oh, and linear algebra um, would be preferred. So hopefully that is good enough. So let me start off with the concept of differential differentiability for higher dimensions. Um, more specifically, uh, we're going to let f be a function from an open set. And by the way, this is a notation for an open subset of a particular topological space uh, from Rn to Rm. Say that f is differentiable. At a point Rn, if and only if uh, there exists a function R of xp, which is going to end up being an m tuple. So let me R of xp, which is R1 of xp to Rm of xp, and a matrix. A, which is M. This denotes the class of matrices or M by N matrices with coefficients in R, um, such that the magnitude of R of X A approaches zero. As, oh, I changed it to A, didn't I? Um, as X approaches to P. Um, and for all x and u, f of x is equal to f of a, a times x minus a plus norm of x minus a times r of x. Okay. I'll keep changing it from a to a to p. A equals p. We'll just put that up top. I was practicing with a and now I switched to p but I can't commit. So, so this is gonna be on um, the definition of differentiability. You'll notice it's actually very similar to the concept of differentiability from R to R. Um, more notably, this matrix A. Uh, so if F is differentiable, then A is the Jacobian. Do I need to go over what the Jacobian is or do you think I'm fine? Okay, so that's the concept of differentiability. From there, we move on to what a regular surface is. So, definition surface. So, before I start with the actual definition of a regular surface, maybe we should go over what the concept is. Basically, what we're doing is we're considering what you might think is a surface in R3, and then we're kind of pasting on patches from open sets of R, right? So I'm taking these open sets of R2, sorry, not open sets of R, open sets of R2, and then I'm gluing them onto the surface to kind of represent the surface. So um, definition of regular surface, so a subset S R3 regular surface, Any P in S there exists U open in R2 and V open in R3 such that and a mapping X from U to V intersection S such 
such that the first condition is that x is differentiable. And by differentiable, I mean that um, all of its uh, partial derivatives are, are continuous. Um, all of its continuous partial derivatives exist for all orders. So its continuous partial derivatives exist for all orders. Uh, two, x is a homeomorphism. S and three DXP is injective. And what I mean by uh, DXP is DXP is the Jacobian at that particular point. That's that's that matrix A from the very first definition of our differentiability. Okay, so DXP is going to end up being an injective function. Okay, so an example of a regular surface, you can just take the set of all points yz, where uh, x squared plus y squared equal to 1, and you can come up with two parameterizations, uh, x from u to s and x bar from u bar to s, such that x of uv is going to end up being cosine of u, sine of u, d, x bar from u bar to v bar, is the same thing, but with bars, but the use of these. Um, and then you're going to have u is equal to 0 to 2 pi plus r, and then u bar is equal to negative epsilon to epsilon cross r for some epsilon greater than 0, preferably less than 1, so we don't end up overlapping again, so we end up having that homeomorphism. Uh, you can kind of take my word for it that these satisfy all the possible properties. You can check with yourself if you want. Um, but uh, it's definitely true. This is a definitely a parameterization for a cylinder. And moreover, if you see these overlapping sections, you're going to usually have overlaps. Um, in fact, I think it's practically a requirement that you have to have overlaps if you're dealing with um, some form of compactness. Um, well, here you're lucky. Yeah, you have one global coordinate patch. Yeah, yeah. If you have one global, like for example, the plane, the plane usually has a, has a global coordinate patch, um, as well as the paraboloid, that's an example. It's actually diffeomorphic to the plane. Uh, but yeah, in a, in a couple of slides, I'm going to only be talking about um, single patch parameterized surfaces. So I won't have to deal with this overlapping property. Um, but yeah, that's my example. It's just the cylinder. OK. So next, uh, what we want to do is, because we have this differentiable structure on surfaces, we can mention something called the tangent plane at a point. So intuitively what it is, let me keep drawing the same surface over and over again. Um, we're picking a point onto the surface and then we're assigning differentiable curves at that point. And then what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the derivative. Actually, we should do a... a Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do tangent vectors at these points, and I'm going to construct something called the tangent plane. Okay, so the tangent plane, or ETS, is going to be the set of all V and R3, where V is equal to alpha prime of zero for some alpha, which is a curve. So alpha is U, S, is a curve onto the surface. Okay. Um, moreover, we want alpha of zero to equal to our point P. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, so these are the conditions for um, a vector to be in the tangent plane. So how do we know that this is actually a tangent plane? How do we know it doesn't um, span R3 or, you know, if it spans it? Well, I guess they're vectors, so they would have to span. So how do I know that this is a two-dimensional figure? Well, let's start off with a theorem. So... EPS is equal to DXP of R2. And because DXP is considered to be a linear operator, as all matrices are linear operators, what we're going to end up seeing is that we have a vector space going into R3, which would mean it's a subspace of R3, so the tangent space or the, the tangent plane at 
the point of the surface is going to end up being a subspace, a vector subspace. Okay, so there's your linear algebra portion of it. I don't think we need to go into a lot more linear algebra for that. So let's prove this. Right. So containment. Right. So let uh, W be in TPS, and W is equal to alpha prime of zero for some alpha, which is a curve. Um, you can fill in the rest of the details. So what we're going to do is we're going to end up saying um, that, so we're going to let u be an open subset of R2 and x with the parameterization onto s. Um, so then q will be p. We'll say that. So these are just a couple of definitional things so that I can actually work with this. So w is going to end up being my um, derivative vector at zero with alpha. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that beta is equal to x inverse of alpha, which is a curve from negative epsilon epsilon to r2. Okay, um, so this implies that alpha is equal to, oh my bad, x of beta. So if we apply the derivative to it, or the differential, so it's not actually going to be d alpha p, but rather d alpha zero, because we're evaluating it zero from there, um, is equal to d of x of beta evaluated at zero. Which, um, there is a higher chain rule that um, works pretty much the same way as the chain rule that you would think from reals to reals. So we're going to be applying that. That will end up being dx beta of zero times uh, d beta evaluated at zero. And this is going to end up being dx q, which my q is such that x of q is equal to p um, of beta prime of zero. Right. So that actually gives our uh, containment in this direction because W is in the tangent plane, and then I ended up saying, showing that uh, it's equal to the XQ of some vector here, right? Um, of some vector in R2, uh, mainly because here we have eta of T is essentially described as U of T, V of T, right? And then beta prime of T is prime of t, v prime of t. Sorry for the horrible handwriting, but it is an R2. Okay, so that's one containment. So the other containment, let w be in dx q of R2. Um, then consider the curve gamma from negative epsilon to epsilon to R2 find as um, gamma of t is vt plus q, where w is equal to dx. Okay, so this is where my v is defined. Then gamma 0, gamma prime of 0, which is v. And uh, x of gamma evaluated at zero is b x q gamma q zero, which is x of, um b. Actually, yeah, right. So I guess here um, it seems a little bit circular logic, but what I'm saying is uh. If I describe alpha as my curve, sorry, not bar, rather S, that gives me my, um, that shows that W is in TPS, right? So this is my curve. Okay, so this is going to end up being alpha prime. Okay, so this implies that um, W is in Aiden, oh. sorry to interrupt. What is that weird sound in the background? Air conditioning? Probably. Yeah. 
What does it sound like? Does it sound like air conditioning? It sounds like I don't know. Anyways, it, it's fine. All right. It also could just be be me like tapping on the, the tablet. It's like a animal sound. I don't know. Anyways, Got keep it. going. All right. So anyway, uh, what we end up seeing is that uh, the tangent, the tangent plane at a specific point is a two-dimensional. Okay. So why is this important? Um, this is important because now we can actually define a basis on it, um, and that particular basis is going to end up being the partials x u and x v where X is some parameterization of the surface, right? Or the parameterization at a particular point of the surface. Um, and the reason that we can show that this, this is definitely a basis is because of the condition that DXP is injected. Um, Your sound is cutting out, just by the way. Okay. Uh, basically, what I said was that the tangent plane is a two-dimensional vector space, and we're going to let our basis be the partials of the parameterizations x, u, and x, v. Um, and we're allowed to do this because x, u, and x, v are linearly independent because the um, Jacobian is injective. Okay. Okay. So now we have a basis for our particular vector space, um, and we can actually um, well, we can do a couple of things with this. We can figure out the first fundamental form, we can figure out the second, um, and we can figure out Gaussian curvature, which is what I'm going to get into. But first, uh, let me talk about normal vectors. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define, it's, it's essential to the cross product, right? So I'm going to take um, xu wedge xv, which is what most people know as the cross product, but I'm just going to define it as wedge. Um, this is a um, bilinear alternating skew symmetric function. So we can keep that in mind for whenever we're doing computations. But how I'm go going to define the normal vector is um, more specifically at a point. Is I'm going to be defining n of p is xu wedge xv over the normal vector. So that we end up getting a normal vector. Okay. Um, actually, kind of wishing I did this after the first fundamental form uh, because it'll pertain more to the second. Um, and uh, first, I was going to define the Gauss map. So we'll get back to this. Okay, so first fundamental form. Okay, so the first fundamental form what we're going to do is uh, we're going to consider um, a vector um, in the tangent plane. So consider P and S, where S is a surface, um, a regular surface, and negative epsilon to epsilon to S such that alpha of zero is equal to P, right? And by the way, all of my curves are gonna end up being differentiable curves. I won't be dealing with non-differentiable curves. Um, then we consider some beta, which is this, it implies that alpha of T is equal to X of U of T. Again, by chain rule, we end up getting is that um, alpha prime of t is equal to x u u prime of t plus x v v prime of t, right? So if I take the inner product, I guess those t should be zero, so, um, but anyway, so if I take the inner product, I end up getting um, this with itself. What we end up getting is this structure. Okay. 
Okay, and this is actually what the first fundamental form is. Usually we denote the x u x u as e, x u x v as f, and the x v x v is g. Okay, so why do we even really want to consider this? Well, it has actually it has a couple of applications. Um, it mainly just makes computations easier. Uh, by a tremendous amount. And then we can describe um, certain properties about the surface that might stay invariant under certain conditions. Like um, there are these things called the Christoph symbols. They stay invariant under local isometries. Um, and the Christoph symbols depend solely on the first and second fundamental forms. So that's kind of why we're computing these. They allow us to know a lot more about surfaces. So let's move on from that. And let's talk about a certain property area. Okay. Um, first thing I want to do though is create a definition. So definition a domain B, a subset of an open set R2 is an open connected. Set of R2, um, where closure is also contained in the open set. The region R of a subset of S is um, a, well, actually, I'm not really Let's just erase that. Where and the boundary of the is image of the boundary of the is homeomorphic to the circle and differentiable. we end up saying is that, um, or what I'm doing is I'm taking an open set of R2, so here's my surface again, right, and then I'm taking like a polygon, it doesn't have to be a polygon, it could be like a circle, it's just as long as it's homeomorphic to a circle and it's differentiable at all the final points, we're good, and then I'm gluing it to this region, okay, or I'm creating what is called a region, um, but yeah, so x of this domain along with this boundary will be called the region. Okay. Um, oh, I guess another thing I should have mentioned is that d is going to, the domain d is bounded. Okay, so d is bounded. Okay. So now what we can talk about is area more specifically. Um, so area, there's a geometric way to interpret this, but area is defined as um, area over a domain D on a surface S. So I guess it's X of D. Of a surface S is defined as the norm, or not the norm, but the, the cross product of X U and X V is partials, D U D D. Okay, and with a simple computation, So for one thing we have that, we can relate this to the first fundamental form. This will be the computation. First we have this, right? This is uh, something that you can see in Calc 3. You have the cross product of the norm is equal to this. Um, so then this squared is this. Right, which is equal to this. This which 
is going to end up equaling to this. Which you can see it is the related to the first fundamental point, right? Or if we consider the matrix, right? E, F, whoa, F is that? F, F, G, it's uh, the square root of the determinant, right? So this is going to be the square root of F. Okay. So what we end up getting is that the area uh, is equal to the square root of the determinant. Um, I should also note that the area doesn't actually depend on the parameterization given. Um, this is due to the fact that um, in order to reparameterize a surface, you can use the Jacobian and Jacobian affects the parameters that you're differentiating with respect to. So then it doesn't actually change anything. Right? So the computation of that would end up being, so if I have my region or E, so X U H X V E, right? Uh, so let's say I'm differentiating with respect to this, right? Then this is going to end up being. I'm actually going to leave out the region, but you know exactly where it is. Uh, this is going to end up being this, right? So X U R X V R, and then the Jacobian. Right, but this is also that you, um, this here is this. So it remains invariant under uh, parameterization. Parameterization does not change um, how the area is affected with any region or the image of a domain. Oh, okay. We're starting off again. Wait, what? Try adjusting your mic really quick. Um, it's still making that noise, whatever it is. I'm not I'm not actually sure where my mic is. Okay. It's, it's, still, it's still fine, I guess. Um, it's just this weird sound in the background, but keep going. Is it bearable enough to? No, it's definitely bearable. We can hear you. There's no problem. It's just. Well, I'll show you afterwards. Well, you listen to the recording. Okay. Um, anyways, keep going. Thanks. All right. So um, that's the concept of the area of a region, and it's going to become more important when we get to minimal surfaces. So now what we're going to end up doing is the Gauss map, right? So if I define n of p as the cross between my partial derivatives divided by its norm, well, I end up getting that this is a unit vector, right? So what I can end up doing is I can end up describing n. Oh, and note, because this is the wedge product of two differentiable functions, it's also differentiable um, divided by this. It's, it's going to always be differentiable. And more noticeably, because xu and xv are linearly independent, we end up getting that their wedge or their cross is non-zero. So this is what we're finding. Um, so if I take n from a surface to the sphere, s squared, right, then I can talk about at a specific point um, a linear operator from the tangent space of the original surface to the tangent space of the image of the point of the sphere. Um, but because the tangent plane at the image of the point of the sphere is going to end up being the same as the tangent space of the original surface, I end up getting that D and P is going to be a linear operator from the tangent space at a point of the surface to itself. Okay, so it's a linear operator, right? So something we want, might want to do is uh, show how it affects the basis elements. So 
though, if we consider some alpha from this open set to S, uh, we can consider the norm composed with alpha and note that we can actually describe this in terms of two parameters. So what we end up getting is that dnp of alpha prime of zero is equal to dnp of q prime plus xb prime. Right, so uh, I guess what I'm saying is, um, let's see. Yeah, alpha, sorry, I should probably put this up here. My apologies, I've got the instruments, so alpha. Alpha is equal to x of u of t v of t. So that's the reason we can do this. So this is going to end up equal to this, uh, but this is also equal to n prime of u of t v of t, which is n u v prime plus n v v prime. Right, and because this is a linear operator, we end up seeing that d n p of x u is n u, and similarly d n p of x v is n u. Um, so yeah, this is just a couple of computations trying to determine later on what we're going to end up doing. But uh, one thing we should note, right? So d n p is a linear operator. Uh, of from a two-dimensional vector space to a two-dimensional vector space, which means that d and p of some sort of so some sort of vector from R two um, is equal to some sort of matrix So we have some sort of representation for a matrix, and with a matrix, you know, first thing you might want to compute is eigenvalues and eigenvectors, right? Determine what those are. Well, the eigenvalues, or well, okay, maybe not the eigenvalues. I actually don't need to get into it. So here we have D and P can be represented as a, a matrix, and if we take the determinant of, and this is going to be a little bit of a use of notation, but I hope you understand what I mean. Um, the determinant of this is going to end up being um, K, which is the Gaussian curvature. And then we have that the trace, which we denote as H, is the mean curvature. If we were to figure out the eigenvalues, which let's say is k1, k2, um, these are actually called the uh, the principal values, in which with those principal values come their principal vectors. Those are going to be the eigenvectors. Um, we have that k is k1 times k2. Oh, one half the trace of the my bad. And h is one half of k1 plus k2. So that's just something to know. When it comes to eigenvalues and eigenvectors, there is a relationship, and this is pretty much it. It's directly related to how eigenvalues relate to the determinant and the trace of the uh, matrix. Okay, so now that we've talked about, um, now that we've talked about how DNP is a linear operator, we've talked about the first fundamental form, as well as Gaussian mean curvature, we can talk about um, the second fundamental form. So, how are we going to compute the second fundamental form? Well, what we can do is we can take, um, well, I guess it's more of a definition, right? So. It's the same thing, except now we're going to be applying 
the differential operator of the normal vector. onto um, a vector in the tangent plane, right? So what is this exactly equal to? Well, we can compute it, right? We end up having that this is um, so it's n u u prime plus n u v prime, right? And this is x u v prime plus x v v prime, okay, from the computation before. Uh, so we end up getting that this is equal to, um, well, it's negative actually, right? So negative um, nu xu u prime squared plus um, nu xv u prime v prime plus nv xu u prime v prime plus nv xv okay and something to know is we can actually prove that nu xv and nv xu are the exact same thing so this ends up becoming um uh, so this ends up becoming e u prime squared plus 2f e prime squared prime v prime plus g v prime squared. Okay, um, where e is equal to the negative of the this inner product. F is n u x v or n v x u, and g is n v x v. Okay, so this is probably something that's notable to prove, right? So if we were to compute, well, okay, so for one thing, the normal vector is orthogonal to both xu and xv, right? So we end up getting that the inner product is, is equal to zero. Okay, so something we can do is we can apply the partial derivatives to these, and it works the same as um, product in or product rule from calculus. So what do we end up getting? If I take the partial of B here, I end up getting that um, NV XU plus N XUV is equal to zero and NU XV plus N XVU is equal to zero, but because we have continuous partial derivatives of all orders, we're going to end up seeing that these are equal. Um, I can't exactly remember the name of that term right now, but it's important. Um, Nathan, you look like you know. You remember the name? Oh, I don't. I just I remember that it's called something too. I just don't remember what it's called either. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So if anyone remembers, Moreau's theorem, I think. We'll go with it. Okay. So we end up getting this right, but these guys are equal. So what do we end up seeing? We end up seeing that. N V X U is equal to N X U V, the negative of it, which is equal to N U X U. Do I end up getting that? Okay. Um, more so what these computations actually give us is that uh, N U X U, the negative of it, is actually equal to N X U U. And same for here. And then what these give us is that uh, negative n u x v is equal to n x v with the negative n v. Okay. So we end up getting these computations as well. Um, and the reason this is kind of, well, this is actually more neat than anything, because um, this ends up becoming uh, 1 over. of x u x v x u u. So we can talk about everything in terms of the parameterizations as um, compared to like computing the normal vector and doing all this. Uh, well, I guess we would still have to compute it, but um, yeah, it just gives us a little extra material.
Okay, so we have all these computations. Um, so, let's see. Right, so we've computed the first and second fundamental forms. Um, and now what we can do is we can try and determine the Gaussian mean curvature using the first and the second fundamental forms. Um, and the reason we can do this is because of the whole purpose of, or the whole thing about D and P being a linear operator, right? So this is U prime, U prime. So this is, again, so I'm going to do A11, A12, A21, A22. So what does that say? That says NU is equal to A11 plus A21 XP and NV is a A12 XU plus A22 XP. Okay. So if I were going to compute um, the, so I'm going to try and compute the uh, second fundamental form using the first. So we have that negative E is going to end up equaling to NU XU, right? Which this is going to end up being um, A11F plus A21, oh not F, sorry, E, plus A21F. Okay, and then we have negative uh, F is NU XV, which is a uh, a11f plus a21g. Uh, Negative f is also equal to nv xu. Um, and this is going to end up being, let's see, so nv is a12e plus a22f. And then negative g is nv xv, which is a12f plus A22 uh, G. Okay, so this computation here ends up giving us the following matrix. We end up getting that negative E F F G is equal to A11, A12, oh sorry, um, actually the other way around, A21. Um, yeah, it is meant to be switched in this case. It's not meant to be, it's meant to be uh, that these flip. So A, a2, okay. so this is equal to this multiplied by E, F, G. Okay, so we end up getting that A11, A21, A12, A22 is the negative of E, F, F, G. And after a lot of computation involving a, determining what these terms actually are, uh, what we can do is um, we can find out that the Gaussian curvature, so K is going to end up being E G minus F squared over E G minus F squared. And H is going to end up being um, E G minus 2 F F plus GE over EG minus F squared. So we have determined the Gaussian and the mean curvatures in terms of the first and second fundamental forms, which is great because that makes everything a lot easier to deal with. Um, okay. So now we can actually talk about minimal surfaces, right? Uh, does anyone have any questions so far? I know that was kind of a lot of information, but it might have been a, like a review for some people if they've taken a differential geometry course. I do, but I'm going to wait until the end. So keep going. Okay. This is like part two for me. So, all right. So, minimal surfaces. So, a minimal surface. A surface. Mean curvature at every point is zero. Okay. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to talk about why this definition works. Um, but first I should say that minimal surfaces doesn't always necessarily mean minimal or so minimal surfaces in the sense of um, minimizing area. Uh, but I should say that it isn't always minimal. Um, it just means that like in terms of if we have some sort of function which represents area based off of a uh, point in R um, that it's critical value is zero. So it isn't exactly minimal, it could be maximal. Um, so yeah, just keep that in mind. Um, and the idea for this, uh, actually I'm gonna draw here. So this is something called the catenoid. Um, and it's actually an example we'll be going more into later on. Um, but this is an example of a minimal surface. Um, in fact, it's actually infinitely long, so you can you know, keep going with it. So, what this basically says is that every single point on here is going to have a mean curvature of zero. So if I take any, let's see, let me just do this, right? So if I take any two slices, right, and then create these curves, maybe this one's more angled. Um, what that tells you is that in between these two simply or simply closed um, curves, that the surface that has these curves as the boundary um, has minimal surface area. So that's what it allows us to do. So if you can find two simply closed curves on the catenoid um, that you particularly want, you can find a minimal surface that has these particular curves as a boundary. Um, given two simply closed curves and then trying to determine um, a surface that has minimal surface area in between here is actually a much more difficult problem, but um, there is research on it. And I believe my book references, let's see. Um, yeah, chapter two of Lawson. Um, there's a better reference at the end that I can probably give. What was the author name? Uh, Lawson. How do you spell that? L-A-W-S-O-N. Lawson, and then it has the number 20. Uh, there's references. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So this is this is actually a much more interesting problem, but it, if it happens to be the case where there's an already known existing minimal surface and you want to try and do this problem, but you can find two simply closed curves on an already existing minimal surface, then you've solved your problem, whatever it is. Okay, so... Um, first, let x. So in this case, we're only going to be talking about like single parameter surfaces. Okay, so s is going to be a single parameter surface. So this is this is already homeomorphic to your open set. Um, so yeah, so what we're going to do is we're cons going to consider this parameter. Um, and I am going to define um, something called the normal invariance. Yeah, the norm, sorry, the normal variation of um, certain boundary regions. So let D be a region and define from the D closure to R. Normal variation closure consider P of D, which will be the original surface plus P times H of D. where T is in some epsilon ball with sufficiently small epsilon so that we can retain um, XT being a regular surface. Okay, so So 
go back xt, which is um, so xt is dwt is a regular circuit. So, what is the intuition behind doing this? Like, why are we describing this scalar and why are we describing this key that allows us to? construct this function and then come up with this regular surface. Okay, so the reason what we're doing is we're basically taking um, some sort of surface, right? And then we're picking a point and then we're rising that point up. So we're basically drawing the same curve, except at this particular point, we might make a bump or we might make it smoother or we might Oh, yeah, I guess bump it or make it smooth or twist it in some sort of way, right? So that allows us to kind of see what the surface would be like if we were to raise it or flatten it. Because what this will allow us to do is allow us to take an existing surface and then kind of mold it into something that has um, mean curvature of zero. Okay, so. I, I'm not exactly good at drawing, um, but the book that I'm referencing is a Differential Geometry of Curves and Surfaces by um, De Cormo. Um, and he has an excellent picture in the minimal surfaces area of this particular or uh, exception. Um, actually, well, reference it. Can you see it? Yep. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to make you full screen, but I can see it in your little box. Right. That's that's basically the. Yeah, that's the idea of it. it is we're kind of raising, um, raising parts of the surface or flattening parts of the surface in order to create the mean curvature at zero. Okay. So what we end up getting, right, from considering a fixed t. So if we consider a fixed t, x t. Right, we get x t u is going to be x u plus t h u n plus n u h, um, and x v t is equal to x v plus t h v n plus n v h. And for the sake of not boring you and having a ton of computation, um, the end result is we consider the first fundamental form. And this will end up equaling to the square root of one minus four t h h, where h is the mean large mean curv curvature and little h is the um, the normal variation of x of the region um, plus r bar times the square root of e g minus f squared, um, where r bar is a function from r to r such that the limit as t over zero of r bar over t is equal to zero. So should it be square root or should it, the square root be gone? No, you're right. Square root should be gone. My mistake. Yep. Match from t goes to zero, yeah? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, okay, so this this will just be this separating. Okay, so we end up getting this. Okay, there's no square root. Um, yeah, so you end up getting this where this occurs. Um, this will go away once we take the derivative. So what do I end up getting? I end up getting that the area of the region, right? So I have a function of t, a of t, which is the area of x of d closure um, of etgt minus ft squared square root du dv. And this is going to end up equaling to this, right? I'm just going to call this r. r of the square root of, that's where the square root comes in. So the square root of 1 minus 4 thh plus r bar, square root of eg minus f squared du dv. Okay. Oh no. Can't add any more pages. 
Is, is it really max 20? For what? I can't add any more pages. It's done. Um, All right, so thanks for coming to my talk. Um, maybe just start over at one, I guess. I'll just go back. Okay, and erase everything. Um, just the first page. I mean. Well, I guess what happens in this, so I guess a prime of t, right? I don't know if there's a way to go all the way back. Uh, so clear. Clear. My drawings. Okay, so that was everything. Doesn't matter anyway. Um, so we end up getting, yeah, so a of t, I'll just rewrite it again. R square root of one minus four h h t minus r bar or plus, can't remember exactly, uh, square root of e g minus uh, so we end up getting that a prime of t is equal to um, 2 hh negative uh, square root of eg minus f squared. This is where the concept of minimal surface comes in. Okay, so theorem a prime of 0 is equal to 0. Or I guess it's not a prime of t, my bad, it's a prime of zero. A prime of zero is equal to zero if and only if h is equal to zero. Okay, so if h is equal to zero, this implies a prime is equal to uh, zero is equal to zero. I feel like that's pretty obvious, right? I mean, this is a prime of zero. If h is zero, then the whole thing's zero. Okay, um, so, so this is what this direction? So this direction, uh, suppose um, a prime of zero is equal to zero and there exists Q on S such that H of Q is non-zero, right? Um, oh, actually, no, there's a little more than this theorem. So a prime of zero. So actually, maybe I should just read it. Okay. Um, so X is a regular parameterized surface, and then D is your bounded domain. Um, X is minimal if and only if A prime of zero is equal to zero for all such D and all normal variations of X of D bar. So for any H that is a normal variation. Um, normal variation and um, D is any region, any bounded domain. I bet. Okay, so again, this direction is obvious. The other direction, uh, so suppose that we have an H of Q that's not zero. So then what we're going to do is we're going to end up um, letting H be, so D bar be defined so that H of Q is equal to H of Q. Um, H H is greater than zero and H vanishes outside the small neighborhood of Q. Okay, so what we end up getting is that um, A prime of zero is negative double integral R h squared uh, square root of, um, and this is negative, right? Contradiction. I had one of my professors do this once, explanation for question mark, contradiction. Okay. So we end up getting, that's uh, how minimal surfaces come about. Why are they called minimal surfaces? Um, because the mean curve drew being zero almost implies that the surface area itself is minimal. Okay. So lastly, something to consider. Um, I'm sorry, uh, it doesn't actually imply that it's minimum. It implies that it's a critical point of the area functional. Yeah, I addressed that earlier. Um, it's Like minimal doesn't actually mean minimal, it just means it's a critical point. So it can be saddle point, yeah? It could be anything. Uh, it could be maximum for all you know. Yeah, it could be maximal. 
Yeah, okay. There's something like compact surface that would make sense, I think. I mean, to, to get the minimum, it's more subtle. You will end up with nonlinear second order equations. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, there is one thing, though, is that you can't necessarily have an elliptical point, and I guess elliptical, the definition of that is when the determinant of, sorry, is greater than zero. Um, so we know this can occur because if we consider the uh, principal values, uh, we have that H is K1 plus K2 over 2. Right? But if this is equal to zero and the surface is minimal, then we end up having that um, either both are zero or one of them is negative. So then you end up getting that the determinant of DNP is K1 times K2, which is either, well, it's either zero or less than zero necessarily. So they can't be elliptical. So I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how maximal plays. I, I would like to, I'm curious about that. It seems interesting. Okay, so something that we might wanna consider is uh, when, the, um, when the normal variation uh, H is considered to be the mean curvature itself. Okay, so what we end up getting is that a prime of zero is r, um, right, my bad, which is h squared okay, and another way of saying this is that um, if we say that, uh, let's see, I need to come up with another symbol I'll call it Z. Z is gonna end up being the mean curvature times the normal curve or times the normal vector um, that A prime of zero is this. So what it basically says is that we wanna be able to deform um, we want to be able to deform this region um, based off of the mean curvature and the normal vector at that specific point of the surface if we want to try and construct a minimal surface. Okay, um, I only have one more thing, which is um, about uh, isothermal surfaces. And then I'm pretty much done after that. So what is an isothermal surface? So let X be a parameterized surface. Okay, so I'm gonna let this be a parameterized surface and then uh, X is isothermal. Okay, so X u, x u, x v, x v is equal to this, and we have this orthogonal basis. Okay. So one thing to note is that um, if I differentiate this with respect to u, I end up getting that this is equal to um, this. Uh, and if I respect, if I differentiate this with respect to v, I end up getting that x u v x v is equal to the negative of um, x u x v v. Okay, so what we end up getting is that these are equal. Right, 
So then XUU, XU uh, plus XU XVV is equal to zero. So that XUU plus XVV XU is equal to zero. Uh, similarly, we end up getting that uh, XUU plus XVV XV is equal to zero. So that this particular vector is in the span of the normal vector at that point. Okay, so it's parallel to the normal vector. Okay, so uh, given the conditions, we also get that H, uh, which is the mean curvature is GE plus, sorry, minus 2FF plus uh, EG all over um, EG minus F squared one half, but we end up getting that the F is zero um, and the E and G are actually equal to each other. So this is gonna end up being one half of, um, let's see, so this is G E plus G E all over E G, um, which I guess is just E squared, right? which is one half G plus E over E. Um, so what we end up getting is that E H is equal to, uh, actually I think I made a mistake here. Oh, my bad. Uh, so, do, 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 do. Get that. Oh, right. Okay. So G plus E is actually N XUU plus XVV. Right. Um, which this is going to end up equaling to one half of XUU. Sorry. Okay. So as a corollary, what we end up getting is that um, if I have that a function is harmonic, um, i.e. if I have that uh, partial f u squared plus this v squared um, is equal to zero, then um, it's considered to be a minimal surface. So if we have a parameterization, then x is minimal. If and only if um, x, y, and z are harmonic. Is it if and only if, or is it just if? I believe it's an if and only if. Okay. Because if it's harmonic, then you end up getting that it's well. Yeah, it's based off of that equality from before. Um, so, yeah. It's based off of that equality from before, from here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, and that's pretty much it for minimal surfaces. Um, the example that I would give would be the catenoid. Um, I can write that up real quick. It's X of UV is, ah.
sign of E and then you have A, B, A, B. Okay, um, and this is the catenoid. Uh, what you end up getting is that uh, E equals G equals A squared R squared V. Um, you get F is equal to zero and then this gives you that This is equal to zero. Um, so basically what that tells you is that it's a minimal surface. It's the shape that I mentioned from before. Um, and that's pretty much it. Cool. Um, so thanks. Um, I, I don't know how to do that without being awkward. So, oh, also I have to tell you, um, Lewis and Will says thank you as well. Um, their power shut out at their house. So they disconnected. Oh. Ago. Now I'm back. Oh, you're back. Good. Okay. Yeah, so back. Okay. So, um, does anyone have any questions? I have some, but I'll wait for a second. If anyone else has some first. If not, um, I have two. Okay. So, question one. Um, so you define curvature and mean curvature uh, as in terms of determinant and trace of this matrix. Do you have more geometric interpretation? Yeah, yeah Gaussian and mean curvature, yeah. So do you have more geometric interpretation of what this? Okay, so more geometric interpretations. Um, mean curvature is kind of hard. The minim minimal surfaces kind of describe how mean curvature is used for the geometric interpretation of it. But Gaussian curvature, um, there's like a list of conditions. I don't know, I don't know. can you see that board? Um, I too far. Um, I don't know if we can your screen full screen. I don't know how to do that. Um, I double click the. Ah, okay. I see. So if I double click your screen, okay, we're good. I can see. Is it viewable though? Can you guys? Eh, it's kind of blurry, but <laughs> right big, and we'll be able to see. Okay. So, um, right. So if you have the determinant of. DNP is greater than zero, then this is considered to be an elliptical point. So what you're looking at is um, a surface that's kind of spherical. So like um, something more hilly, I guess. Yeah, so more like that. All right, so this is when you're going to determine it. It's going to be greater than zero. Um, if you have that the determinant is less than zero, um, you end up having kind of more of a saddle point. So, right, in every possible case, what you're finding is that um, some of your curves are going to be more upwards while more or others are downwards, right? So this is a, this is elliptical. This is hyperbolic. Um, and if you have that the determinant of this is equal to zero and this is not equal to zero, if the differential is not equal to zero, then uh, the point parabolic. Um, so in this case, like the cylinder is going to end up being, um, or is going to end up having these conditions, right? Because if I consider any point on here, in one direction I have just a straight line, there is no curvature at that point, but in another direction I have constant curvature. Um, well, it doesn't necessarily have to be constant, but you get the idea. You're going to have some sort of curvature in one direction and no curvature in another. And if you have that DNP is equal to zero, then it's too low now. Um, I can't see. Whatever you just wrote, I can't see. It's too low on the board. Oh, okay. Um, well, the last one just says that if you have that the differential of the normal vector at a particular point is zero, then you, you're going to end up getting that it's planar. Okay. Yeah. Um, so before I ask my last question, does anyone else have any other questions? If not, then I have one more. Um, so you said that one of the problems in minimal surface theory is you have, you start with two curves. Yes. Yeah, simply closed curves. And you look for, or find, the problem is to find minimal surface in between them like that. Like, so for example, it could be something like this. Yes. 
I don't know, it's on a minimal surface probably, but you yeah. start with two curves and the job is to find um, minimal surface between the two, yes? Mm -hmm. So two questions, I guess, or two part question. One, does it always exist given generic curves with nice enough conditions, so that, say they're both C1. And two, is it unique? Um, so could there be possibly multiple curves between those two? I'm not exactly sure. I mean, definitely there has to be an infimum rate. I mean, you can't have zero area and it still be a regular surface. Um, so there must be, it must exist, I see, yeah. So there has to be an infimum. I'm not sure if it's minimal, but um, I feel like it would exist. Yeah, okay, I agree. As for the uniqueness part, I have no clue. I don't see how you would see how it's unique. Um, somebody else with more experience, if you can answer that, I'm not quite sure. I'm pretty new to the whole geometry field. Same. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Nathan, are you asking about plateau problem, uh, plateau problem, as it's called? Um, uh, don't know the name, but the, the problem is, Sort of what I think um, we said. So I mean, plateau, plateau problem, which was solved by Jesse Douglas in the mid 30s, 1930s, is that if you have a sh curve, it's a very difficult problem because it's minimal surface equation is nonlinear equation, uh, second order. But if you have a curve, uh, is there a minimal surface passing through it? It's a basically Dirichlet problem. Yeah, so it's sort of like that, except for I think the, um, the problem he's posing is you have two curves and there's minimal surface passing through two of them, but one would be... Yeah, clear. that's 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 a multiple connected domain version of plateau problem. So is it, it's answered in the positive or...? Uh, I, uh, I, my, I, I think so, I would say so, yeah. Okay. I, okay. I, I think so. Uh, I mean, it's... Uh, I mean, there is a book by Courant uh, just the principle and uh, basically dedicated to explain Douglas's solution of Plato's problem. Okay. Uh, so, and there okay. are some probably, I mean, that's, Kurant is not a great expositor, but, but uh, that may be some, some more modern. There is a very nice introduction to minimal surfaces by Osserman, just a little that? book. Robert Osserman, Minimal Surfaces, yeah. How do you spell the last name? Uh, basically, as you hear it, O-S-S-E-R-M-A-N. Okay. It's, uh, you can get Dover, I mean, I have it, but not certainly. Hold on, uh, I may have it here, hold on. Um. So I'd actually like to address a question you had before um, the if and only state if statement for the harmonic if and only if minimal. Yeah. Um, yeah, I should have. The X has to be isothermal. Okay, so it's in that case. If X is isothermal surface, then you can do it. Yeah. If X is isothermal, minimal if and only if each X, Y, and Z are harmonic. Yeah. Okay. Where did he go? Just walked away. Um, yeah, okay, so the, I like the variational principle in there at the end. Um, Sorry, I can't I can see it now. Probably maybe I moved it to, to, to my office. But it's it's, um, it's Dover book, yeah? It's a Dover, so. Okay, so that's easy to get. Yeah, it's like uh, for 10 bucks. It's, it's very nicely written. Okay, and, so uh, and uh, sort of uh, there is a nice essay on uh, minimal surfaces from the point of view of harmonic mappings because what appeared in the ends, this isothermal coordinates, you know, that's a harmonic map, right? You it yeah. reparameterizes the domain over which the minimal surface sits. If you just forget about z coordinates, right? It it just reparameterized by uh, the uh, harmonic map, right? Because uh, harmonic map is just map yeah. 
when the yeah coordinates are transformed by harmonic functions. So there is a pretty good chapter on this in Peter Durin's book, Harmonic Mappings. Okay, I'll check that too. Yeah, that one I have here. It's uh, I, about 10 years ago, I gave a course on harmonic mappings here. And okay. So, uh, well, Plato problem, I think, has a positive solution. I mean, I, I w wouldn't, uh, for simply connected domain, for sure, but, but for multiple I connected domain, I think, I think that's what Douglas did as well. But okay, so I'll have to check. Certainly not, uh, not an expert. And all the domains in this lecture weren't simply, or they were simply connected, and all of them were. Wait, no, I guess I'm not. They're just connected. Never mind. So, if there are no further questions, um, we can just talk for a while. And that's what we've been doing for the past two things. So, um, how is UF? Is it quiet up there? Yep. Nothing there going. Yeah, there's, there's very few people here. Nothing's, I mean, barely anything happens here to begin with. Yeah, well, I mean. Yeah, so now that there's no school, you took like half the way, half the things away to do here. There's only studying in bars. That's pretty yeah, much cool. it. Yeah. It was pretty empty. Um, oh, Anna's here too now, I see. I don't know if you can hear me. What happened? Oh, I can hear you. I see that you're here. Ah, yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 as always, they arrive late, mostly yeah. for, you know, just chatting because uh, there are so many meetings right now online. And so I, I was talking with Jean-Francois before this, but I wanted to say hi to everyone. It was nice to see Dima also. Yeah. Okay. The mic is off. Hi, Anna. <laughs> How everybody's doing? Well, alive. Great. <laughs> That that we just receive a, a a message like that cases are going up from uh, from Tampa something some communication but uh, is that what that last email said I saw it come in but I didn't I yeah didn't. yeah it's going cases are spiking in in Eastbourne City that this is what I they brought so okay. oh that's <laughs> good to know. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Can we the probably way... close the presentation uh, so that oh. I can, we can have everybody? Yeah, Hayden, close your screen so we can see you. Wait, what? Unshare your screen so we can see people's faces. Yeah. Oh, um, good point. Oh, and also, if you get the chance, send me the slides if they all save, or if they didn't, then it doesn't matter. Stop here. Okay. Oh, well, let me stop recording, maybe. That would be a good idea. Yeah, yeah I was about to say that. So you 